So we have a really interesting guest here. Is it okay if we use your first name? We're not gonna say yes. John yes. Okay. Yes, of course. Yeah. So this is John, and John, he's been telling me, I'd say, pretty amazing stories, and I, I want him to share this with with our fans. This is pretty incredible. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. So, so basically, to start, um, you know, I was like a normal guy. I mean, obviously, you know, in my early twenties. Uh, and so I'll talk about the first encounter. So, you know, I was, I, I never thought about Bigfoot. Bigfoot was like the last thing in my mind. Um, never even really, I never really even heard of Bigfoot. And, uh, it was, you know, it's, it's like one of those things that you just, you know, I, I mean, I'm sure I've heard people heard about it on TV now and then, but it wasn't like something that was on my mind. So, um, we used to go backpacking, uh, quite a lot, local mountains here, which is called Desolation Wilderness. Uh, and again, it's near Lake Tahoe. It's about 20 miles uh, south of Lake Tahoe, or actually, I would say east of Lake Tahoe on Highway 50. Um, so, if you ever, if you're not familiar with the area, uh, it's usually considered. It's around the area called Twin Bridges. And so, if you ever listen to like um, weather reports, they always indicate Twin Bridges. You know, so the, you know, they would indicate that as a location when they start calling in, you know, different weather conditions and stuff. So, there's um, uh, quite a lot of hiking trails through that area. And I really uh, loved to go hiking at the time, yeah. and I still do today. And I had a lot of friends. We used to go up there with them. So, like, five or six of us would go up there for, like, you know, two, three days mm -hmm. and just enjoy, you know, the nature. You know, we'd go hiking in maybe four or five miles, uh, rest, camp, have fun, do whatever, and then we'd come back. And uh, one, one particular time, uh, the year was, uh, I believe, 1990. Uh, 1990, yes, 1990. And I remember it was May. Uh, it was a nice spring uh, here. I think the day was the 16th of May, if I'm not mistaken, of 1990. And it was a warm day, nice. We, we had planned to take a trip, and it was the first trip of the of the, of the year for us. And we, we usually go up a few times in a year, a couple, two or three times up there. And we decided to go up a separate uh, hiking, hiking like direction. So, you know, normally you'd park at Twin Bridges, uh, and then at the time it wasn't really that developed. So there was just like a dirt parking lot. I don't think there was a ranger station there that was occupied at the time. And so you would just basically uh, have to go in Placer, Placerville and just let them know that you're going up there, get your permits and things, and then just go up there and go, go up, you know, backpacking. So um, we went up there and we decided to go uh, a little further up toward Tahoe, and maybe not too much, maybe about a mile. And there was a small little dirt parking spot out right off the freeway, and there was another trail i don't recall what the trail was called but it went up along the ridge the right hand side of the ridge of those mountains uh of desolation wilderness so for instance that particular part of Des desolation wilderness is is called uh we used to call it referred to it as uh horse Hill falls because that's the waterfall that would come down it's like a i believe it was a, at least a mile possibly a mile and a half of a very steep rocky climb very arduous actually to go up there especially with a 50 pound backpack but we decided to try a different route because we really didn't fancy, you know, lugging our stuff up this really arduous kind of hike and, and, and rock climbing situation. So we went up the side just to experiment to try something new. And it was uh, it was pretty hard. There's just no two ways about it. It was probably just as hard as twin. Th this side trail was also just as hard as as Horsetail Falls, except it was it was a little bit more gradual. You know, because in Horsetail Falls, you, you walk hike in about pretty straight path through a little forest along a creek for about three miles. And then you hit the base of the mountain and you hike your way up, up this uh, really arduous climb up, up, up Horsetail Falls. But we went in the other way uh, along the ridge on the right-hand side. And uh, it was, I would say, just as hard, except it wasn't like, like really, you know, it wasn't hit. We didn't get hit with a steep climb in one location it was gradual throughout throughout the whole hike and it actually felt a lot longer so what was interesting is we came up there friday morning around 10 o'clock um and we started hiking now we all came prepared you know because it is lake tahoe and you do get freak storms up there all the time because of the lake you know so we came prepared with other jackets and hiking boots and all that kind of stuff plus we, all had, we also had shorts and short sleeve shirts and everything else just 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 in case if it was cold or warm we were prepared so we went up this hike, and we and we finally made it to a particular point where we said, okay, well, this is as far as we're going to go today. 
and we're going to set up camp and basically, you know, camp in it for the night and continue the next morning. Uh, it was pretty dark, pretty late that night. We we basically camped in. Uh, the next morning we woke up and uh, there was snow around us. And in fact, from our vantage point, we could see Horse Hill Falls, you know, off in a distance because we were so high up on the mountain. We were close to like the part of the, the, the mountain where it actually had a drop off. And so, but we didn't realize that at night because it was kind of dark. We didn't see the drop off. Fortunately, we didn't go too much full, too much further because that would have been disastrous. But we stayed back in the safe zone. But still, we had a beautiful view uh, right out of my tent. I could see Horse Hill Falls, and I could see that there was snow and ice on it already. Because usually with Horse Hill Falls, that's sort of the cutoff line between snow and rain. Below Horse Hill Falls, it's usually just rain. Above Horse Hill Falls, uh, it is basically snow. So we realized at that point that we were kind of in trouble. We decided, you know, we have to cut our trip short. We have to go back. So we had to make a decision. Do we want to go back the way we came? Or do we want to go ahead and just uh, climb up the side of, you know, the ridge of the mountain? So we're right up on the back ridge or the, the razor's back of the mountain, the ridge part of the mountain. And uh, we decided to go forward along the razor's back of the mountain, mountain because we felt like, okay, well, we're already up here. We might as well hike in half a day and then cut down across the mountain down into the upper lakes area that's up above Horsta Falls. And then we're going to cut back across toward Horsta Falls and just go down the, the, the sort of incline, those rocks. It's a lot easier going down than it is going up, obviously. So we decided to do that, and we kind of wanted to see the area because it's also very beautiful, and we felt like it was, um, you know, it was something we wanted to see. And it was quite interesting. So... As we kept climbing, it didn't start snowing. Um, it did get very cold, so we had to switch over to our cold weather uh, clothing. What, what time of and year? As we, what time of year was this? Uh, this was May 16th. Uh, I believe May 16th. Really? It started snowing in May. In May. That's yes, it was a freak storm. Exactly. Um, really weird. And what's interesting is it, it just hit us all of a sudden. I mean, it was just Friday was sunny. Saturday morning was snowy. Uh, just like that. Hmm. And what happened was... We had climbed up for about, oh gosh, maybe I would say about four or 500, 500 meters up the side of the mountain. And the elevation, I believe the elevation is around, oh gosh, I don't remember. I think it was probably like 7,500 to 8,000 feet elevation at that point. And what happened was um, we had gone up the side of the mountain and we had uh, encountered these trees, the pine trees, were stunted. So it was a very, very kind of a surreal sort of um, uh, experience where we saw the trees, mm -hmm. and they were very short. They were like no more than seven foot tall, but they looked something very, very much from a fairy tale. And I've never really seen yeah. that before myself. But from that particular location, because of the lack of oxygen, I guess, and the altitude, yeah. the tree growth was stunted. And it was very strange. And that's when we looked back toward Plasterville, because we were so high up on the mountain, we could see right down Highway 50, going between the mountains and all we saw was a huge ball like a snowball literally rolling toward us i mean talking a gigantic snowball a ball of snow is what it looked like coming toward us and we knew that was a storm so i figured guesstimated we had probably about 20 minutes before that storm hit us so in, in fact it hit us in about 10 minutes and so it first started off with um like white fog everywhere enveloped us you couldn't see more than maybe 20 meters ahead of us and at this point we didn't know where we were hiking so we were like we knew we were on top of the mountain so it's not like we're going to get lost you know it's not like we're in an area with there's a lot of flat land where you can get lost we were on top of the mountain so as long as you stayed on the ridge of the mountain you pretty much knew where you were uh but what's interesting was the snow started to fall and it was a very powdery kind of snow very very like it was, it was like it wasn't falling heavily. It was sort of like how can I put like like fluffy feathers coming down, and it had the most unreal kind of surrealistic experience. You know, you felt like you were in. It wasn't reality. It felt like a dream, mm -hmm. you know, up there because in a way because you were you, you it was like the only thing that brought you back to reality was when you would take a breath and the ice cold air would go into your lungs. It would wake you up at that point. So you knew that that was real. You know, at that point, it's almost like pinching yourself. But as we hiked further, the stress and the um, the uh, uh, sort of kind of the stress of, of the whole situation, you know, we were not very we were not happy campers because we didn't like to be up in this icy cold area. So we so we kind of split apart. 
some of us went, some of the guys went up further. Some of the guys stayed in the middle and I kind of stayed back. Um, I had to take a leak, you know, and I was up there. And one thing I remember very distinctly was I was walking on this um, ridge of the mountain. And, and let me explain the ridge of the mountain. So the, the, up at the top of the mountain, it's not like you're walking on this trail that falls off to the left and falls off to the right. You're like in a mini valleys. So when you're walking, it's like a path that meanders across, rises and dips and rises and dips. And there's clusters of boulders like massive outcrops of granite boulders with pine trees growing out of them up there. So your line of sight was probably about 50 meters at most, you know, because it was so many dips and ups and dips and downs, whatever. So your line of sight was very short, you know, but it wasn't like a thick forest, you know what I mean? So I got left behind. I had to take a leak, and I kind of got carried with my own thoughts. And I remember when I was walking, uh, I had – walking in the snow with my boots and there's one thing I really can't stand is when you walk in frozen snow that's sort of the sound your boots make when they crunch through the snow mm -hmm. it's almost like a sound of crunching through styrofoam okay I for some reason I can't stand that sound mm -hmm. and so I here I was I was miserable I was cold I was also sweaty um, my boots were starting to get wet I, w I didn't have like the right kind of socks for snow because we weren't anticipating snow and as I was walking I was hearing this crunchy sound of the kind of the sound your boots make and then I heard a whistle behind me now mm -hmm. at first I didn't register it I heard it but I didn't really register it now remember I was all by myself my teammate my, my, my actually my, my friends that came up there they were I don't know how far they had they were far enough so I couldn't see them or hear them you know they were out of sight and I was kind of by myself back there and I wasn't fearful. I wasn't scared. That was the least thing. I mean, I was at all. I was just still kind of miserable for being up there, because of all that, all that snow and wind and just, just the whole sort of situation. So as I was hiking, I heard a whistle behind me. It sounded really strange, but I, I heard it, but I didn't really register it until I heard it again, and it sounded exactly the same. The first thing that came into my mind was the whistle sounded sort of uh, metallic. Now, not that it was metallic, but it was very strange. It wasn't a bird whistle. It wasn't like a bird. And as I was walking, I stopped. And I just kind of turned my neck a little bit to hear, what the heck was that? So the first thing that came to my mind was there was people up there, and they were kind of playing games with me. You know, why would they be – or maybe someone came up there with a dog. But we never saw anybody. We were way high up on the mountain. There was nobody up there. You, you say it and, sounds uh, metallic. You mean mechanical? Is that what you mean? Not mechanical. It sounded like you had a whistle – that was made out of metal, okay? And then you blow the whistle with a metallic tint to it. I can't explain it. It's, it did not sound like a bird's whistle mm -hmm. at all. Um, it kind of sounded like something like, um, like, yoo-hoo, kind of like that, like, <laughs> like that. And I was like, and I kind of felt like, you know, that's really strange. So I stopped and I listened. I stopped really still and I, can't, and I was, I remember I was standing there because of the altitude, there's no noise up there. There's no wind. There's nothing. It's so oppressively quiet that it almost feels like a pressure on you, atmospheric pressure on you up to, at, the, at that altitude. And so and what I was hearing really was my own heartbeat in my ears because the altitude, I could hear that more than I could hear outside noises. There was nothing out there. And it was, remember, it was just it, it, the snow was the, the sort of snow came and left, but it was still kind of uh, cloudy um, and it was sort of like gloomy, not really cloudy and dark, but more of a, a misty white kind of type of environment. And it, it, was, it was a diffuse light coming in from the sun that was basically being diffused by, um, spread out by the, the whiteness of, of the fog or the cloud or whatever the heck we were up there. And I would listen to this thing, and I thought to myself, after the third time I heard it, I would stop and listen, and nothing. And I'm like, okay, well, whatever. So I kind of start walking again. I take my third step, and there it is again. Like, I'm like, wait a minute, dude, somebody's pulling a freaking joke on me here. Someone's pulling my leg. So I stopped and I turned my head back and I was trying to figure out where the hell was this thing coming from? Now, remember, I was by myself up there. There was not a living soul up there other than me and the other guys. And the other guys were gone. They were ahead of me. So I was left behind and I was thinking to myself, this has got to be some guy or some people uh, playing jokes on me. You know, because it's, it's really, it was obvious. I walk, I hear the whistle, I stop and listen, nothing. 
So I, at that moment, I was like so close to just walk back there to where I thought I heard the whistle. It was probably about 20 yards behind me, behind a, like a clump of cluster of granite outcrop of boulders. It's like behind it. I was just about to go walk out there to hear what the hell was making this noise, this whistling sound. And then I heard the second whistle, which was coming from the forested area on my right. And that's when I suddenly, my, I, I had goosebumps at that point. I had no idea what that was. Immediately, like a flash, it went through my mind, is this a cougar, mountain lion? No, mountain lions do not whistle as far as I know. Is it a bear? No, bears don't whistle as far as I know. Are there any other animals like that could be predatory and dangerous that whistle that I know of? None that I know of. And that's when I realized, I didn't realize anything. At, at that point, I got this sensation of immediate intense fear it's not like i was afraid of something it just hit me and inside of me there was like a voice that said run that's it just run and that sensation of the goosebumps on my on me and the fear i turned around and i ran like hell toward back to where i thought my friend my friends were and i left that spot i went up there and i ran for quite a while because they were pretty far ahead of me and I found them, and they were all there. And the first thing I said is, hey, guys, that was really shitty thing you did to me playing games like that. And they kind of looked at me kind of annoyed, and they said, what the hell are you talking about? And I was like, well, who was that whistling back there behind me playing games? And they kind of looked at me like, you're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. You're getting, you're, the altitude's getting to your brain, whatever. Mm -hmm. So they were all pissed off at each other because of the altitude and the, all the crappy situation we're in. And so at that point, I realized they're all accounted for. They're all up here. So back there, I don't know what that was. And that, and what happened was that because of the situation of getting back and I had a hike and we were sort of kind of at each other's nerves and all that kind of stuff, I kind of forgot about it. And so I really forgot about this whole situation for many years mm -hmm. and um, many, many years. And I didn't really even remember or think about this situation uh, until I had read that I heard about Politis' books where yeah. he talks about the missing 411. And I realized, holy crap, dude, if that stuff is real that he's saying, I was in a position up there in the same exact kind of situation that most of these people disappear are in. Uh -huh. If you read his books, it's like there's a storm coming in that was not, that was not nobody expected it, uh -huh. a severe storm. I could have disappeared and my tracks would have been covered by the snow. Nobody ever would have found me if that, if that indeed was the case. So I thought to myself, wow. And, and then I heard another story where in, over in like Indonesia and the Philippines, I think, where they're talking about where people don't go into certain jungles with colorful clothes mm -hmm. because they know that if they come in with colorful clothes, they, there's a chance they might disappear. Yet then the whole saying is, from what I've heard from one of his uh, lectures, was you wear dark clothes, browns, blacks, camouflage, earth tones. And I, what's interesting is I was wearing all black. Just by coincidence, I had black pants, black cargo pants, black boots. I had a black jacket on. Uh, with a hoodie, black hoodie, and I had a dark, dark blue uh, backpack. No one's and so I'm thinking, <laughs> well, I, yeah, I know. But but the point is, was interesting. I wasn't wearing bright colors, so I don't know. And so years later, when I when I kind of put two and two together, possibly, you know, I'm not saying that's what it was, but it's really, really coincidental that that happened. Um, I realized that you know what? I went back and said, oh, were there any Sasquatch sightings in that area at that time? Around let's say two years before and two years afterwards. And indeed, there were. There was a lot of Sasquatch sightings. Yeah. And then I realized later, after I did some research, that well, evidently the Sasquatches tend to whistle. And that's the younger ones, the yeah. juvenile, the ones that are younger, they tend to whistle because they're curious. Yeah. But I also heard that if there were two of them, one behind you, one on the side, that maybe they were hunting you because they might mm -hmm. be sort of grabbing your attention so that the one from the flank, you don't see him. Yeah. Yeah. And he'll grab you. So there's all kinds of things. So when I think about that, I'm thinking, wow. Yeah. I wonder if I, I wonder if I like dodged the serious uh, bullet, you know, at that time. So yeah. that was my first experience, wow. like I said. And at the time, I had no idea about Bigfoot. I didn't really. I mean, Bigfoot wasn't even in my well, mind this, at the time. This area, yeah. this desolation wilderness. I think that's a hot spot because there's a famous backpacker story from '92. We were there in a, was this? 1990. 1990. 1990. Okay. Yeah, this one is 92. This is two years after you, okay? And this guy, he was doing what you were doing. He was, he was in Des Desolation Wilderness. He's going up to Wright's Lake. This is a very fa uh, famous one, too, by the way. And he's going up there, and I guess they were just trying to find this enchanted pool. I checked out that place. Really, really 
amazing place. Uh, these little these little holes on the rocks, because the whole entire mm-hmm. area is just rocks, right? But yeah, it's, it's really weird to see these these indentions on these rocks. Like a, it looks like little pools. They call it enchanted pools. Anyways, they couldn't find it, I guess. So his friends decided to just leave while he just stayed there and camped. Mm-hmm. That was a big mistake, because uh, as he was camping, he kept hearing rocks being pelted at him every like five minutes you know he's like what in the world is that and this guy had like a like a gun with him like a 45 compact yeah he jumped out of his tent and just like shot into the the tree and yeah this, this went on for a while and he actually um at the height of the thing he actually had a face-to-face encounter with the thing i mean he peed his pants i mean this this thing was it was right there he saw it it's like a female it had like breasts and everything i'm telling you they're up there john you were uh you were lucky i mean it didn't harm him it did freak them out, so I, I doubt, I doubt they would have uh, did anything to you. But who knows? You know, they're animals, right? The animals, they're gonna do what animals do. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. In my experience, um, I really don't know what they would have or wouldn't have done. It's just interesting that they had. Uh, well, I don't know if it was a bigfoot. It was pretty interesting. They were probably more curious than anything. You know, because I was up there probably all by myself in their territory, and they probably were kind of curious who this is, and you know, if that's what it was, you know. So. Did you feel feel like you're being followed? Was that? I funny? yes, I was being observed, and I was being observed, and I was being, basically, um, I wouldn't say I was being stalked. I mean, if it was a bigfoot, it definitely was observing me, and the fact that there was whistling would mean that it was trying to either communicate with another bigfoot or maybe was. Um, trying to get my attention you know so yeah i don't know i just i just know that i got this terrible terrible fear when i heard the second whistle and this sort of deep down you know um sort of a voice said like in a very very desperate way run and it was the kind of thing that when you when i heard when i felt and heard that i didn't have any i just didn't have any options i didn't even think about it i just ran you know just just run Get, get just get out of there like yeah <clears throat> yeah, yeah it was... 90 92 that was a really really hot year i mean if you if you go back to that area it's still underdeveloped it's not i mean i mean I, I, i'm looking at pictures of property up there it's like a 14 mm-hmm. acre property or something for 1.6 mm-hmm. million dollars there's really nothing up there i mean it's it's beautiful it's, it's really um, it is very um yeah it's very um yeah, it's, it's very, it, I mean, there's a reason it's called Desolation Wilderness, you know, because it's quite desolate. I mean, I haven't gone there in the last couple of years, but, uh, you know, but uh, as far as I'm aware, as far as I know, it's still quite desolate. Now, the area down by the lakes is pretty popular in the summertime, so there's quite a lot of people that go up there on the weekends or just for a day hike and stuff like that. So, yeah. but yeah, like what we encountered, this was definitely not one of those times. This yeah. was, you, you, you yeah, you weren't going to see... People up there when we were there just because of snow. Yeah, and you all know what we have to do. I think we got to check out this place because it's been uh, how many years since you've been back? So in uh, 2018, it's gonna be 2019. And this happened yeah. in 2000. Yeah, so 19 years ago you were there. I think we should go check it out. I think we should make it a. Uh, I can look. Look yeah. what I did in you know recently because it, because of the whole interest that I got from this after reading the the, the various stories from 411 Missings, is is I went through on Google Earth and. I knew that area very well. I mean, we've—I think I've hiked that area up like 14 times, in that in that general area. Um, only once on the mountain ridge, by the way. Mm-hmm. All the other times we were up up the center of the valley, not on the mountain ridges. But I, I took a look at Google Earth, and I was able to pinpoint pretty closely, based on the photographs that I have, and just remembering where we were, um, and and sort of line of sight of, of of landmarks and things like, for instance, the different mountains that are there. I kind of know pretty accurately where I was when this happened okay. in a general vicinity, very, very close to where I was when this happened. Okay. So it was very much up there. It was pretty isolated. It, like I said, I, I don't, we didn't see or hear a living soul up there the whole time we were there. Um, just us. And, you know, I mean, if there were, I've, I've been hiking before where there's people and you always, if there's people up there, you'll hear them, you'll see them. You know, there's 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 telltale evidence of the people there. But when we were there, it was nobody. It was nothing. It was so desolate. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So if you want to go check it out, I, I could probably pretty easily find it. But I'll tell you though, it's gonna be it's gonna be a whole day hike, oh, really? and then then you're gonna need to camp, and it's gonna take probably at least 
I would say a few hours the next day before you find that location. Yeah, I think um, during the summer would be a good time. Um, you know what? Let's, I know you have another one. I think we should save that for the next episode. You know, people are seeing something up there. Thank you very much, John. And I, I'm looking forward to your other one. Uh, I, I want to share that one. That was pretty, pretty good. But we'll do the podcast number cool. two. But thank yeah, you very just let much. Me know.